questions uh, please avoid unnecessary conversations in chat win, uh, window uh, the chat window is mainly for uh, for the questions and uh, for the contact details of ul space club no other talks are uh, allowed in chat window if you uh, do something like that uh, you will be removed uh, at that spot uh, so please uh, keep it in mind and uh, please don't share your screen and please switch off your mic and camera uh, so it will be very uh, good to uh, conduct this webinar if you do so uh, so please uh, cooperate with us to the for the well being of this webinar and uh, let's have a wonderful uh, hour, uh, couple of hours uh to acquire knowledge uh, from the national level experts from isro uh, uh my friend sriram is there and shail sir is there to introduce uh, the experts who is going to speak to us uh, today and uh, i'm very happy to know that uh, my two two of my friends are uh, having a uh, discussion with the uh, with these guys uh, so i'm very happy to know that and all of you are welcome uh, once more all of you are welcome to the meet and uh, please uh, keep the instructions in mind and please follow that please don't switch, uh, switch on your mic and switch on your camera uh, please switch off it uh, throughout the webinar unless you are starting uh, you are asked to do something uh, by any of us space club coordinator so otherwise please switch off your camera and mic and uh, please don't share your screen uh, you will be uh, it will be accidentally do, uh, done if you uh, lost the connection and if you get out of the meet and uh, suddenly rejoining if there is a condition uh, you are, you have to uh, click the present uh, don't to click uh, click the join button not to uh, not the presenting button uh, you will be seen uh, two buttons here uh, to join meet and uh, to present your screen so if you uh, facing that type of condition please uh, switch the join meet button don't switch the uh, present your screen button so it will be easy to, uh, for us uh, to conduct the webinar for the well being of the webinar uh, so uh, don't try to make an interruption to the webinar that's the uh, main instructions and my friend sriram is there uh, so we have no time uh, to repeat the instructions uh, once more i welcome all of you to the ul space club space week celebration 2020 uh please keep the instructions please uh, use the chat window in a good way uh, so sriram uh, you are welcome uh, to uh, introduce uh, the uh, the program to the participants okay varnata and you audible ah, okay yes yes you can you are audible okay first of all i like to repeat the instructions one for uh i like to give some of important instructions regarding to this webinar switch off your mics and cameras and we welcome you or till you have to express something important to us and most prominently even if you rejoin after leaving the meet don't press present screen button because if you do so there's possibility of losing the presentation of the speaker temporarily and we wish you to pin the presentation screen of speaker by tapping it from the people list so it will be easy for you to see the slides of the speaker and the chat box is only for asking your questions for the q and a session and all kinds of discussions using the chat box are strictly prohibited due to the decision made by webinar committee this is, uh, discussions can be done in our whatsapp group called cosmos if you are interested in that please dm to varnatan or bharat they will provide their numbers in chat box soon so that's all for now that's the instructions i have to give and varnata is it right time to start the introduction speech ah uh, yes uh, sriram i think in my phone it's 3 uh, 3 o'clock now uh, so i think you can start it now okay sure good afternoon to all of you thanks to varnata for providing the instructions i welcome all the scientists veterans teachers ul space club organizers students and all other participants to the special edition of webinar series on this space week occasion conducted by ul space club we the ul space club is a foundation under the umbrella of uralandal labor cooperative society stands for enriching and flourishing the scientific aptitude of students especially in space field 
within the three years from starting, we conducted many great events physically, that's before COVID. And from the beginning of this COVID pandemic era, we started a new venture called the webinar series on every Saturday, which is going extremely well for these past six months. But today is pretty special for us because you know that the Space Week was started yesterday. For a space club, like one of the most prominent and active one in the our nation, it's a great period of time, undoubtedly. Space Week started from 1999 as part of the decision made by UN General Assembly. It started from October 4 and ends in October 10. The dates were in recognition of the October 4, 1957, the first human-made Earth satellite, Sputnik 1, which is nearly a beach ball-sized one, uh, was launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome on Kazakhstan, thus opening the way for space exploration. And on October 10, 1967, the signing of the Treaty on Principles Governing the Activities of States in the Exploration and Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, including the Moon and other celestial bodies, was then. Satellites improves life is the theme of current year. So we have two sessions on the main topic, importance of satellites in daily life and the role they play in Indian rural and urban life on today and a day after tomorrow. That's in October 5 and October 7. We have four eminent speakers on the variety of these topics. They are Dr. Y. V. N. Krishnamurti, Dr. K. Ganesh Raj, Dr. V. S. Hegde, and Dr. S. Rangarajan. Today we have two of them. Dr. Y. V. N. Krishnamurti, sir, Registrar of Indian Space Science and Technology, and Dr. K. Ganesh Raj, sir, on the topic in relation on remote sensing environment, etc. I welcome you, sir. And as special as the session, we have two student fellows of UL Space Club to interact with these great scientists on the each session. Today in the students panel, we have Master Bharat Srijit and Master Adil Krishnapi. On 7th of October, me and Varnatan will be there as the student fellows. Our all in all, Shadil is uh, here to control the session and he will give the information about our respected speakers. Our chief member, E.K. Kutisa, the former Chadi director of ISRO, is here with us always. The moderator of today's session is the former, HRD, former deputy director of ISRO, K. J. Ramsa. He will be a bridge and born of this session. The whole webinar family, including the eminent scientists all over India, will be with us in this occasion. Our student core team is ready to pick up the questions from chat box. Damodaran sir, the one who plays the major role in connecting us to UL is here to express the word of thanks after the session. So without any delay, I welcome Shajil sir to take over the things.
Thank you. Uh, yeah, Thank you, Shajil. Sir, at the outset, uh, I have very, very personal namaskarams. Mm -hmm. By you, and sir. I hope uh, still, sir, you can remember. I, remember you. You know, I had, yeah. sir. So, yeah. so it's a great pleasure uh, that I am able to share the platform with you. So, welcome to this uh, platform. And also, I heartily welcome and uh, of my co friend and his uh, colleague, Mr. Ganesh Raj. Anyway, Thank before, you, uh, sir, Namaskaram. <laughs> okay. So without anyway, we have people have uh, uh, with all uh, responsibility because uh, we cannot we have us who have been contributing uh, all their might in designing systems, developing concepts, and uh, building the national capabilities in exploiting the benefits of uh, remote sensing for the national applications and uh, and they pursuit of the objectives set forth by our political leadership so i am sure that our uh, gifted children are uh, 
uh, having so many doubts regarding the application of technology and uh, there is no one better than these two great stalwarts that can help you to clear all your doubts so mm -hmm. i request the uh, student uh, representatives fellows bharat and adil to just focus on the topic and also uh, interact with this uh, experts to bring out what all doubts you have in your mind so that uh, they will be able to explain so rather than listening to what you are going to present i am sure that it's going to be very informative you take this as an opportunity for clearing all your doubts you may have or your friends may have so i once again welcome uh, dr ybnk and uh, ganesh raj to start with the proceedings and i will be in the background and i am sure that there is no need for moderation i will leave it to my fellow student uh, friends to uh, do the talking thank you very much thank you uh, jeraman so can i start so i have half an hour time for the uh, presentations if i am right right sir proceed sir you have got half an hour plus actually yeah, yeah sure now uh, my here on the right hand side there is a present now on that i had to press the screen right that is where i'll get into the presentation on my right hand side corner yes sir okay fine thank you first of all i would like to thank uh, uh, mr kuti and uh, Uh, Professor Sajil, uh, to give me this opportunity. So I am a old person, means a, a old acquaintance of uh, UL Space Club, and I also see my colleagues Jayram and Ganesh Raj, and of course uh, I am seeing Professor Rangarajan also has got uh, entered in and Hegde. Okay, you will be concluding on seventh. They put in and very senior people like Subramanian and. Uh, the senior people the youngsters are in this but for this presentation because many students are there to make understand a little bit of uh, how space images will definitely improve our quality of life because uh, this time the the world space week has given to the rural and urban part of it so i'll give a flair of how an image looks like and then what happens in in the other iast and speed uh, so i'll get into my you are able to see my presentation uh, not yet sir is it getting loaded um no sir no sir i can't see anything right now okay so Uh, sir, I can't okay? see any slides right now. Okay, if someone else is seeing these slides, please do tell me. Uh, I'm not sure if it is any error from my part. Uh, sir. No, we can't. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, what I am doing is I went to present now, and I'm asking uh, my entire screen. Okay. Okay, sir. isn't it? That's what I'm supposed yes, to click. And then if you click and on it, you I have this uh, present kind of option, which is written inside uh, some a uh, blue box. No, there is no blue box here. On my right hand side, there is what is called present now, sir, sir, and yes, uh, in that it shows your entire please screen, choose, a window or a Chrome tab. Please choose window, sir. From the person. Okay, window. Okay, fine. Choose window, and then I'm <laughs> getting into this. Okay, share. Fine. Thank you. I hope now you are able to see. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. So the topic given to me is the satellites in daily life, and. their role in rural and urban scenario okay so yes, now i why i kept this image for you all of us we have a country which is having high heterogeneity and when you tell heterogeneity i'll i'll request you to kindly see we have western ghats we have eastern ghats and within this western ghats we also have a rain shadow region these all rain shadow region and then also we have a west coast east coast nicobar islands andaman islands here and then we have a desert sandy desert and then we have the cold deserts and alpine mountains here 
and then also we have flood plains extensive flood plains and mangroves which are there and deltas which are there on the east coast the continental shelves also both are different and then we have uh, the northeastern uh, hills because here the relief length ratio of the rivers are shorter so that makes uh, a different uh, way of modeling if you want to do for hydrological modeling etc like that and then in the central part of the country we have a huge uh, variation so i'll take you to the next to the next variations what we have kindly see the state of maharashtra we are talking about the western ghats which is located here is it okay you are able to see that on the left hand side you are having red color red is actually the vegetation because we infrared has been given the red color here and that's where it is a, is a bright signature so you look at red color but when you just see the ridge on to your right there's hardly any vegetation except for in this this is all the command areas so you have the krishna valley and also the godavari this is the krishna valley a uh, command areas and this is the godavari valley but then when you go into the central part of here this is where you have amravati bulana etc like that here the rainfall uh, deviations can go up to 74% that means it can be plus or minus of a given range and here you have 36000 3600 mm rainfall here you have 1000 mm rainfall and here you have 750 to 800 mm rainfall but then variability is as high as 74% and here you have uh, places like uh, gondia and other places where i'll chandrapur and other uh, part of it so in one state itself you can see such a high variability so this is a resource sat a bit image i'll tell you the beauty of it in why we make these kind of images then you see i'm taking you to one district here in this part okay and this is where there is a called satara satara is the district if you see here uh, the reservoir which is uh, located here a huge one and there is a hill station okay and then here it is 36 3600 mm rainfall this is mahabaleshwar okay and if you see here in one, another taluka here in man hardly 400 mm rainfall only 10 days of rain but in these areas you see lot of flooding also keeps happening and this is all the sugarcane belt this is the krishna valley development area so where you have extensive irrigation and people do the agriculture that means though it's a rain shadow region still you have uh, irrigation just because you are able to put in the dams and then take it up so in one nutshell you are able to get about a district that means one collector controls this and this is around 10000 square kilometers of an area that means within 10000 square kilometers of area you have such a variability now alkaline spectrum in remote sensing when we talk about we have to tell that we have a range of uh, alkaline spectrum in which we use the human eye is sensitive okay from uh, visible uh, region especially in this from 0.4 to 0.7 micrometers whereas we do remote sensing in visible infrared and thermal and also microwave region so the larger the wavelength more the penetration so in the visible part it doesn't penetrate anything but it gives infer certain things in uh, in short wave infrared and thermal we'll see what it is in the next uh, regions okay now these are the type of signatures suppose each feature when we talk about other uh, the fresh snow or uh, the these of course the clouds okay it gives you high reflectance in all parts of the spectrum this is wavelength and this is the reflectance similarly the vegetation if you see in vegetation how it takes in the green it is a little peak because of the presence of the pigment chlorophyll then because of the absorption the photosynthesis process you have an absorption here and again in the near infrared reflects that's where when we give red color to infrared so the brighter the red it is a healthy vegetation then also we have a band called short wave infrared short wave infrared is sensitive to the moisture so the moisture content in the leaves or any other thing if it is stressed vegetation you get very good signature here that means it is not just how much is the strength of a signature in uh, near infrared but also short wave infrared also is very important that's where we have in our almost all satellites in uh, optical uh, remote sensing these specific bands which we use but all images are panchromatic only they are black and white but in a particular band so when we tell about a high resolution satellite data when we tell 25 cm this is the panchromatic range in which it operates but when we talk about a multi spectral so you are looking at different windows of opportunity in between these windows you has an absorption and uh, 
diffusion. So you don't use all the spectrum. We cannot use all the spectrum from remote sensing. But same thing, you can use it on the moon because moon doesn't have atmosphere. So you don't have any interference. So you can do all areas of spectra for imaging on moon. But on Earth, because of the atmosphere, we have a windows of opportunity for remote sensing. Whereas the other one, which is called the hyperspectral remote sensing. So here, it's a continuous imaging around a uh, unit area of the radiance. You, we can image continuously. So the volume of the data will be large. That means in one shot, you are getting so much of information about a particular area. And then this is humanly not possible to do with uh, image processing by manual methods. You have to do employ digital methods. So this is where we graduated from visually looking at the features and also doing certain classification using statistical techniques. But then you have to use more of AI and machine learning techniques if you want to extract more information from the hyperspectral remote sensing. So these are all areas of remote sensing we have graduated in terms of technology and also in the applications. Here, this is where we started off. So this is not the one where we are doing it. We have a host of imaging from geostationary satellites. This is what is located here. And then we also have, this is for mostly for the cloud and other related, and also sounder to get the information regarding the cloud and uh, information, especially for weather forecasting. Then we have imaging, which happens for the land. And then we have here today 25 centimeters is the resolutions which we can get. And then we have a ocean color thing for uh, ocean related. We have ocean set one, ocean set two. Now we are going to get ocean set three. Then this is all other capability, microwave remote sensing. I was telling you the larger the wavelength, more the penetration. So it penetrates more. And also here I kept something like three tier imaging. Last time also I was mentioning to you. I want to reiterate once again and then show you another image how exactly how it covers extra that. And a 3D imaging. This is the best in the world, let me tell you. This has given us the beautiful images. Though it appears 2.5 meters, the stereo of it has been extensively used in India. And also we have information across the globe. These are global missions. These are all sun synchronous satellites which cover in a low orbit to entire world. So we get the information about the entire globe in a uh, continuous manner where we can map. And this satellite is performed more than 10 years. It has performed in imaging and gave a very well valuable data. Then we have a scatterometers. Scatterometers, we use it for understanding the uh, wind vectors on the ocean. And this is also a global mission. And uh, Megatropics is a collaborative mission with the French for the, and then Saral Altica. And the prior to resource that we had, uh, IRS 1C in 1995. In fact, now it is 25 years. So they are also going to celebrate it. It's one of the very thoughtful process in which our colleagues, have, our scientists have thought about such a satellite. And these are so we have global, we have near real time applications you can do with these range of satellites which have been graduated in ISO. So this is what we meant by three tier imaging. Last time also I was mentioning to you a large area which is covered in one shot. This is the AVIPS. That means you can cover more than a district. That's what I showed you the Maharashtra in one shot. The other one is an area of this. So it shows every district and every, uh, this, uh, every fifth day. This is something like 14 days. And then we have a, a smaller area which gives more details, which is a clarity like this. But you also should understand, though this resolution is 56 meters and uh, this is 23 meters, but if you sharpen this, it also will looks like this because all the features, whatever is there in 23 are available in 56. So you have to understand the strength of what is called the radiometric resolution. You should not go by theory of the books. You do a higher high, high, high pass filters on top of it and merge it, you'll get all this information. So in our GI sat, that means in geostationary satellite, uh, which is going to be launched, we have for remote sensing, we have it 56 meters. That means at this. And then we do image processing, you'll get like this. So that is where we are standardized on 56 meters is more than sufficient for all our agricultural applications. I also would like to draw your kind attention to the infrared and shortwave infrared, the same area. Okay. So here, if you see the moisture zone, which is a little darker, is visible here to a certain extent here. But in shortwave infrared, if you can see from here to here, you find there's a moisture zone. And suddenly you are seeing some which is not, which is very faint here, a rock outcrops. Here, here, here. Why these are important is 
these are called cut rock surfaces and in this area suppose if you are making a canal like whatever lying here or if you are cutting across a ro uh, the road or you are making a gas pipeline this is as good as you are cutting across a hill so you have to blast the cost estimates will totally change so any geotechnical surveys etc that will be very difficult similarly if you want to find this is like uh, any on the plants like we did a lot of good experiment on uh, oranges there's a this is called coal sea and how you can identify coal sea disease a long back which has been done using uh, these uh, satellites per se so you can understand the difference when you add short wave infrared you get more in input on the stress on based on the moisture which is existing on vegetation axis back then also on agriculture uh, water management here just to show you an example how three images you can find out before uh, uh, the irrigation starts under a reservoir okay and slowly how the vegetation when you are seeing how the crop is advancing it is not advancing entirely at one stroke so it is slowly going down and but this all still supply based irrigation supply means how much of the water which is available that we are, we are trying to use and at what time everything gets in a particular stage when you do the transplantation the and when it has been uh, stabilized and when it is coming to the uh, harvesting stage all these things we can continuously monitor so monitoring of water bodies wetlands irrigation command groundwater prospecting is all possible using the satellite images because we have the temporal resolution that means we get every fifth day every 14th day every 23rd day so there's a repetitivity of these satellites coming to the same area and giving the information and i would like to also draw your kind attention to in the satellite images always we should not have the best of the resolution for anything you want to do some geotechnical surveys you have to find out a different way kindly look at here bharat you are able to see this dark body and also there is a red signature yes sir yes yeah this is like a straight line like a cut straight line and there is in a right angle there is another line right and another right angle is cutting like this so these are all the fractures so the water besides moving on the streams it also cuts across including the so at right angles also the water moves because this fracture is the earth is a hard surface so when it breaks it uh, becomes conducive for weathering so once it gets weathered so that becomes an area where the water movement can take place so underneath it is moving and this goes kilometers together and this is the best source in uh, hard rock terrains to tap ground water this is the expertise which uh, isro has and uh, transferred it to the state uh, government and they have put it through but also you have see one is the good part of it another part of it is the dikes which you have here it's a dull red dike so it's a barrier for the movement of the ground water so when there's a barrier you may you may get good water here but the other side you may not get because it's it's a it's a depends upon the depth etc like that and there's a way to identify these things if you do a geophysical survey that is a resistivity surveys there's a called radial survey you can know the dip and depth of these fractures dip means at what slow gradient it is going down and at what depth it is if you know do these two factors you can literally tell at if it is in the coastal area at what distance it will open into the ocean if some of you know the shrimp what you get is in the estuarine areas where the fresh water meets the sea water this is where you get the shrimp but you get shrimp in the deep sea also so where is the fresh water coming so these are the fractures which carry the fresh water very deep into the ocean too and they open up so when god knows very clearly that all the human beings are going to dam the water and ensure that not much of uh, not much of bio geochemical process will take place because we have dam so not much of water is going to the river systems and into the deltas but this is another passage which has got made that naturally all the geo uh, bio geochemical process is transferred including the fresh water into the deep sea so there the ecology can be sustained and this is of course some of the uh, information on how uh, uh, it happens on the wells and success rate etc like that but then when you go closer always you think satellite image i want the best resolution but it is not the solution for everything when you go closer but here there is a fracture it got diffused because people already started uh, doing the widen the stream bed because the moisture is coming from here from some of the springs and then this is the fracture zone and they are doing agriculture through bore wells etc and the dikes you can see small small 
a stones type of a thing on the outcrops, but they are at the, the depth, which also runs like this. And there's a water body, there's a tank, and then there's some uh, plants, which is uh, mentioned here. And there's a moisture zone. Why I'm telling is this tank, the moisture is connected to this. And there's also a stream which connects, but this also has been widened to do agriculture in a better way. So that means we encroach onto certain resources and then we do, but still the patterns are there where it becomes interesting to understand uh, the topic in which put them. So for me, the topic is given on sustainable development. Okay, sustainable development means what this is Professor Yuar Rao, our former chairman, has mentioned, and we all work towards that. So we try to do look at many definitions. But finally, we looked at a definition which is more easily understand by people is development using the existing resources, means what are the available resources in an area to meet the requirements of present and future generations without endangering the environment and ecology. So whatever you do, how do you assess exactly what is your need and with the existing resources without endangering the environment and ecology to use. So, so to do that, we need to have a status of the resources, what we have. So this is where under uh, NR census, we started looking at land use, land cover at a particular scales. I mean, this is easy to do on a 250,000 scale because our country is very large. And this is on a, so every year this is being done. And this is every five years at a 50,000 scale. And land degradation, this also happened two or three cycles now. This is two cycles have been done. Land degradation means whenever this topsoil is not there properly conserved. So there'll be what is called erosion called rills. Uh, first is called the sheet then it becomes rills and then becomes gullies. And then it will not be useful for any agriculture purposes. That means the good agricultural lands can get degraded. And snow and glaciers, the information on soils. We also can information on soils, but these are done with different ministries. Okay, there's environment forest, this is agriculture research, there's a land use uh, institute is there, soil and land use institute. And then the geomorphology we did with GSI. Why geomorphology is a, a space images, what they see is on the surface. So on the surface, based on the weathering process, the, uh, the type of lithology which is underneath, and when there's a weathering which takes place because of the weather conditions which are located there, you can tell what type of minerals, what type of groundwater, whatever other things, as I told you for geotechnical, we all can interpret. So the geomorphology mapping has been done for the entire country, we have this. And then of course, vegetation and wetlands. These are all the things which has been mapped and kept and forest, this is being done the Forest Survey of India. Initially, ISRO uh, did it, and then NRSA did it, and then give it to uh, FSI, transfer the technology. Wasteland mapping for rural development, and this is continued by uh, ISRO itself. While doing all this, the Professor Rao has asked us a question, because most of our map information and planning process is sectorial. That means either do it for irrigation, but while doing it in irrigation, we don't really look at the, we look at the gradient, we look at the water and availability, and we try to look at what is the available water versus how much is can be used for command. But we don't look into the interplay, what happens with lithology which is underneath, or which is with the geomorphology, and how to make an assessment of it. So we try to make all these natural resources which is interpreted from the satellite data, and then try to look at, put over one or other, and identify certain potential units which tells this is the potential of the land and check with the existing land use. And if it is not optimally used, how we can optimally use it. But while using it, first we had to define on water resource development plan. And then based on the water resource development plan, what is the extra potential which has to utilize water, we come into the land resource development. I'll show you some details. This is somewhere in uh, Chandrapur, but this is in Chatirgaz in Lohar Daga. In each village, we're trying to look at which is the potential area for check dams, percolation tanks, farm pond. There's a logic on which a model has been run using the runoff, geomorphology, soils, land capability, and other things for a given area. And then based on this, what is the type of intensive agriculture where you can take agro-horticulture uh, with uh, what is that horticulture, this thing? Because you should understand oh, if you only are in agriculture and if agriculture fails, where 60% of our population is dependent upon rain-fed agriculture. So horticulture will give a second livelihood option. That means if this fails also, the farmer will not go to the poverty level. He has something to sustain. And also exclusively where the horticulture or forestry 
and silvic pasture and fuel fodder plantations and such kind of a things can be done so but then we had this interesting thing and when we are trying to discuss with uh, the we are talking somewhere in when pv narasimharao is the prime minister of this country okay so when we at that time when we are trying to propagate one of the secretaries uh, has told ashok basak this is one of the best plans which you made so kindly give us so we'll implement it because this is a no i have, we have never seen uh, such a plans being made so then uh, he has taken those inputs this is uh, something in night 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock the discussion happened when the winter session is in nagpur so he took this information and then tried to use and then he made a approval for that to spend something like 1.8 crores or so but then we didn't know about it but then the next secretary comes and uh, he tells he tells is very good but then he challenged us you space people be in space we know what to do on the ground so there are two ways you can look at it this is where i want to tell you all the answers when you do a very good uh, input to which is useful and everyone appreciates it and then the people will like but when someone makes a statement we have to understand where is the what what is the gap why he made this statement then we understood most of the government schemes though on on a paper or on a map exactly you are able to show what is the potential of the land and what is the best utilization you can make unless you know who is the owner of the land he is a small farmer he is a marginal farmer or he is a large farmer or there is a landless laborer in a given village depending upon that village area where they can do for employment so these are all the factors which has to be put in when they want to implement exactly to do it on the field so he has a valid question or else if a scientist if, if you feel all right this fellow has told okay i stop i stop but that is not the way you should look at whenever someone makes a comment on something we should really not get discouraged we should look into what is that he is trying to expect or look out of this entire scenario and then we worked it and then we started using the cadastral maps that means the ownership details these are all the you are seeing the black lines here these are all the cadastral boundaries which didn't have any geographic coordinates have been geo referenced and place on the satellite data now i exactly know this boundary the number of it from this village and who owns this land all details can come but here i would like you to appreciate something the local wisdom people's wisdom is much much higher than the scientists the reason is if you see this area this you are able to see this little darker green moist you are able to see barat here then they joining areas adi yes sir yeah so you can see this is less than 0 to 1% slope it's a gradient because moisture is going like this this is a hill stream bed which has been widened even if you go to munnar and other places you will see uh, such things but immediately after here 1 to 3% see the land boundary shape has changed then this is 3 to 5% this is 5 to 8% of slope so that means people know exactly how the sun inclination will fall and where the crops will get maximum yield they are fully aware of the, the how to make boundaries actually that for their field bands to get the best so they, they allow the moisture which goes down and they also cut down the erosion in a given slope and this is the best which they could do so there are lot of learning which we can make from these images putting on to the cultural use what people make this is another example just to show you the numbers these are all called survey numbers or these are also called parcel numbers so these have been overlaid so wherever you find bund that means the ownership doesn't change these are all the management boundaries and here someone in this bigger one someone made some fish ponds this i'll come little later these are all the fish ponds this is a part of chitisgarh which you are seeing so all the survey numbers so we started doing this with the money with uh, chitisgarh and maharashtra they put their own money then isro started canasal reference database so for two states karnataka and gujarat has been done with partial support by isro and uh, state government and together they did this and then we have a sp space based information support for decentralized planning where we did for six more uh, states and seeing all this input under the land records modernization program this is one of the component which is done by the federal central government to do it for entire country that means you have a satellite image which gives you the information on the natural resources in land use geomorphology groundwater potential soils land degradation where that means it land regulation tells where is the important area where you should conserve your soil and water so that the land doesn't degrade and gives yield whatever is it 
well having all that finally we need to know who is the owner is it owned by government or is owned by private and where you are trying to do and what scheme which will fit in and then how to do so there's a lot of homework to be done and people are used to do that now and then but here i would like to look at see this is one survey number who is going to be a beneficiary so we know the farmer's name the survey number and before implementing actually this is a small slope so in the field we don't have to do much of survey they are actually trying to do some conserve but then there is a small area in this area we said we can do farm ponds and farm ponds is a new thing in chandrapur you are seeing the year 1995 that's been implemented so this is before implementation i am taking you to back certain time and this person got the benefit of the development this is how we are trying to do this is khajana uh, khajana means your tur dal and he has taken wheat and then there's a mirchi is all he's growing like any in a delta but then seeing the benefits of it this gentleman the same location the same trees are located here he made two more ponds because he is a very marginal farmer he got 80% subsidy for implementation and this cost around 18000 at the time and then we don't need lining if you need because there is a clay content is high so we said no lining required and we got funding from the lead bank because lead bank doesn't look at agriculture we told these ponds can sustain uh, because of uh, in the even because the 1000 mm rainfall is there even summer seasons there will be 1 meter of dead storage so you can have fisheries inland fisheries so that is what they caught because that's a commercial activity so that's the lead bank the nabard has advised the lead banks in every area so to encourage this and that is how the farm ponds came in but then he is trying to do so then the subject goes from sustainable development to ganesh raj subject of environment so if you try to import more water where the it's an impervious material the adjoining fields what will happen is the salts which are there underneath by capillary action they come to the surface and once they come to the surface the salt concentration because of the osmosis process which doesn't take place the lands get degraded this is what is called lands getting saline or salt affected and there is a huge problem in the irrigated areas what takes place so we should understand to what extent we can use and what action we go that means at that smallest level also we need to monitor regularly or else the person gets the income he gets income he gets much more more, more income and is more happy with all those things but then he is creating a problem because of the adjoining fields what happens and also i'll show you this is all the canastal overlays which has been kept to get a feel of it you see uh, this is a railway line and this is the moisture zones that means this moisture is starting from here we have a spring spring water collected is in a tank and this light uh, this thing means it's a silted water body is not a maintained water body but this moisture zone is going down the hill this is called zoro cultivation okay but then meanwhile the railway line came in between and see this moisture exactly is cutting here that means this is always a source of breach because the water is getting accumulated because we didn't take a passage here we should have presumed this is an active stream and allowed this passage of the moisture to go so then this would have been better so these are all the simple things which can be done even by a common sense looking at the images besides going into the other part which i'll try to show you this each color is one village within that the boundaries of the canaster and put the number on top of it there's a village tank and there's a farm boundaries now you kindly see here you can see a small boundary as a come here this is like a shape of a river and this white things is a old settlement that means old village so this village is by this river here subsequently the river moved to here and then it put some sand deposits here so this is not so this is called the point bar deposits so there is a lot of sand and people start uh, digging for and this got laterized and gravel and so many things people excavate in here so that is guy this is getting silted fast so it says images with certain overlaps and patterns you can deduce why and reasoning you can deduce in a very simpler way to put this is where understanding is potential the honorable prime minister has mentioned that we should have a proactive interaction with all the departments so in september 2015 we had a major conference in government uh, in delhi with 1200 um, ias officers all the administrators right from the newly recruited branch who are on probation to the cabinet secretary to the prime minister and all the secretaries of government of india and the chief secretaries of all the states and there are uh, presentations made by the secretaries in the morning and in the afternoon 
the prime minister spent two hours hearing to the secretaries, eight secretaries briefing, briefing about 86 ministries. So each secretary has to brief about a, a few of these ministries. And we had more than 170 applications which has come in all these segments, which is for planning, monitoring, evaluation, decision making, technology development. And also, parallelly, uh, the Prime Minister also has formed what is called group of secretaries. Instead of looking for which ministry will do what to bring in integration, either for agriculture or for uh, governance or for citizen centric uh, services. So this group of secretaries have been formed into to take and farm side we had more number and also in the urban on solid waste disposal etc. So the here because we talked the topic of urban and rural. So in urban we started with NUAS. Okay, we had mapping at a particular scale and then started doing it urban information system. Now we have Amrut cities and also we have smart cities. So the concept is because the Amrut, last time also in my talk I was mentioning to you about the 73rd and 74th amendment of the constitution. So the urban local bodies can plan for their own, that means the local wards, what you call in a city, they have all the resources to plan for themselves. To, but to plan, you need the information. So that information is provided by ISRO under this Amrut program and the urban local body will make the urban planning. That means if the, for the next five years or 10 years, where they will do bring in commercial use, where they'll bring in the development for uh, public utilities, all that they will plan and they'll put it on the website itself on the Bowen, where uh, people can access and also question, deliberate. Normally these plans which is made are only available in the office which is displayed. No one goes uh, there and looks at it. Today it is possible to do. And then everyone can look in and give their comments. What is that from the urban planning perspective? Similarly, for decentralized planning, this is the village level. That is 74th amendment is relevant to this. 74 uh, amendment, where we are empowering them with the information which they can do for planning and also the implementation monitoring. And here, a lot of training is being done. A lot of training of the officials. They hear all the town planning department and here the Panchayat Raj officials are, are being trained and Ganesh Raj is one of the person who is taking care of the southern part of the country and uh, that part. Now, there are also on good governance, while doing all this, the government always looks for what is the impact it is creating, their schemes. One of the important things, last time also I was mentioning on livelihood security, because first is sustenance, that means everyone has to sustain, and then, then you go to the sustainable development, it means economically you become stable, and that whatever you have become stable should be sustainable in terms of the ecology and the environment. So this is where the uh, water conservation, water and soil conservation schemes have been uh, converged. So whatever is being done by individuals here, whatever your dots you are seeing in different colors, each one you click in your own village. You go to your village, click there, what is the activity, you will know what is being done. Is a check dam being done? Who is doing it? Landless labor or getting the benefit? Everything is in the public domain and it is done through the mobile which is existing. And mobile today has become like a remote sensing because it gives you an image and also it is uh, locking the time and also the content and the location. So all the three things cannot be tampered with. And so we are able to monitor the housing schemes or the watershed development, which I shown you, the IMSD is related to the watershed development. See, in why we, I, didn't, I missed one point, maybe I'll just quickly go through that slide. Here we take a watershed, the reason uh, is, this is a small drainage divide. So water, whatever is coming here is only getting through this river or stream outside. So this is approximately 10,000 uh, hectares or 15,000 hectares. It's a small area, okay? So we know what is the incoming solar radiation. We know what is the incoming precipitation. And whenever you do some changes here, we know how much is the runoff, what, uh, what is the stream runoff is reduced. So how much is going into the in-situ moisture which will develop for a larger uh, benefit of it, understanding the groundwater and the land capability potentials. And then how much is the changes versus the change in potential evapotranspiration and the runoff. These two things we can measure. So we know incoming solar energy, we know incoming precipitation and we going outgoing uh, evap potential evapotranspiration and also the runoff. If the runoff is reduced, Evapotranspirations are reduced, so that means you are sustaining certain 
energy here itself and that energy gives you the results that is the overall concept when we talk about the watershed and government spends almost today when we are doing what in 1995 it is 400 to 600 rupees per hectare today the government is spending 12 to 15000 rupees per hectare so that's a huge money so to monitor all those schemes we developed certain apps called shrishti and drishti so which helps the people looking at and this has been graduated into pixel parcel and parcel that means pixel is a satellite image uh, of a given location the smallest unit then which person for that pixel and also that is a parcel that means the ownership of his land but then i also mentioned about the uh, ease of doing business and crop insurance because this insurance we need to insure to people to be sustainable suppose something fails agriculture fails or something fails so there should be a so there is a fasal bima yojana in which it is being protected to get certain resources similarly we have the fisheries so we have a satellite for uh, ocean resources is information is being given by incois but it looks at the ocean color and gives of this color chlorophyll and also the sea surface temperature today we are doing from different other satellites but in ocean sat 3 we will have chlorophyll sea surface temperature and also the wind vectors which i was telling you from scattermeter all from the same satellite and there's a global satellite today our fisherman is getting uh, benefited and they get the mode of information through all mechanisms and today with uh, navic receiver also they are getting this information on to their uh, boats and this is a great step in fact you will be surprised to know almost like 35000 crores of rupees are being saved based on the separate uh, inventory which has been made because the search time reduced and catch increased because they go exactly to location in the fronts where they do the fish but other bigger thing is the third livelihood option because when we are doing the sustainable development i told about your farm pond but there are lot of ponds already existing and in these existing ponds if you make it as a sectorial that means if you make this as a as an organized sector for industry you will get very good yields from these tanks this is from different districts you can see how much is the uh, it is a very big sum that means 4500 tons this is a very conservative estimate and how to do so along with this lot of processing uh, elements will be there and for that you have an opportunity for doing in terms of uh, supply chain management so these are all the things where as an entrepreneurs you can do better job and then i was telling you the irrigation is supply based today but we don't have that much of water to have a supply based irrigation even for uh, paddy so we need to control that in terms of demand based irrigation scheduling and also the soil health card which is being made for micronutrient fertilizer blend that means which is different for each crop unless it goes to that level and that is the opportunity for all young boys and girls who are hearing me this is one to understand science second enjoy the images make your own interpretations but finally you have to do something where you become an entrepreneur not just because you make a big living but you are also serving a lot of people in giving employment opportunities because you have got an opportunity to learn it first and then make it and from isro because they look at from synergy of remote sensing communication and navigation we talk about the security in terms of food water energy health shelter infrastructure and information so up to 2030 what are the satellites which are there will give you the information on it and then the sustainable development because we kept all this agriculture urban coastal these are all related to the sustainable development goals of un so there are 17 but of all the 17 all the things there is a space technology role per se to play but our job is to ensure in what segments which is which of the ministries which will play a role that is where the group of secretaries and the meeting with all the administrators this all happen in looking at how to put through isro's job is to put on the best of the satellites both in optical and micro and then in multi spectral multi temporal multi spatial and also these institute sensors because today on the field you need lot of sensors and today most of these things are not indigenous and there a lot of scope for youngsters like you to make indigenous sensors and integrate with the information comes from the satellites so we can suit of applications which we can put through but one word which i missed is the wisdom taking the local wisdom back into our knowledge base is also very important so then we are not looking where is what but why and so what that means we model perspectively and give an an advance information for in a real time mode that's where the earth observation satellites which i have mentioned 
but this is the all weather capability so this suit of satellites are going to come whether you want it or not they are getting done because the everyone these all user demand see the user has demanded these satellites and that is where it is being done nisr is a collaborative satellite between nasa and isro and these are the sustainable development goals so out of the 17 when you talk about no poverty zero hunger good health and well being everywhere there is a component of space and some are related to satellite communication some are related to uh, even for climate action i would like to tell there are 51 uh, ecvs that is uh, climate variables essential climate variables out of 51 23 are amicable with space and iso is doing 13 and these are all climate qualified databases which will be useful for this and we publish this information through nrsc bowen website but my friends and children you have to understand that whenever you having the best of the technology or whatever you want to do please understand two things one is what gandhi ji has mentioned there is enough for everybody's need but not enough for anybody's greed so this is still is valid in our country god, god has given us sufficient but whatever you want to do first your goal should be always look at the face of the poorest and weakest person and then see ask yourself whatever i am doing what is the gain they are getting then your problems all will be solved there is no problem of resolution there is no problem of imaging either you have image or no image intuitively things will come to you that should be your goal then there is no comparison between anyone if you see that is my goal and how you are useful with what all knowledge you are going to gain you may become a big entrepreneur you may be become a big businessman or you become a great scientist or you can give a become a great writer but always my request is kindly put this as your goal and most of the isro colleagues put this as a goal that's where they achieve big and they do much bigger thing because they don't have expectations much in life thank you for your uh, kind attention and on the left hand side what you're looking at is done from a mobile phone and put it on the satellite so always it is not that you need satellites aircraft drones even whatever little equipments on in your hand also you can do wonders so this is where i stop my talk and uh, the basic thing is the sustainable development we did it in isro from way back in 1990 itself we thought about it and then we now the sustainable development goals are there so all our resource programs are related to how the how to um, that satellite data how it can be utilized for the sustainable development goals but in between i touched about one or two applications to give you a feel of to what extent we go when we do an application per se okay yes jira ma i'm still in time or i cross time sir you are 5 uh, uh, minutes more actually uh, you will be able to stay back sir yeah i'm here only time. i'll get my desk for you are leaving sir no no i'm at my desk i'll be hearing oh uh, sir sir okay 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 sir yes, sir you have another 5 more minutes sir to conclude yeah. so someone can ask me some questions and things can ask yeah uh, jeram that can be used subsequently jeram we can use yeah, it subsequently yeah, yeah. sir sir question answer session we will uh, we will postpone to the end of the session sir because yeah, yeah sure so i can hear ganesh also yeah, yeah. then uh, i can uh, we can sum up the question and answers okay sir sir okay thank you very much yeah. sir very good timing and very all encompassing and invigorating thank you very much thank Kuti, you kuti sir kuti sir anything uh, kuti sir are you ah, okay, okay 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 it has been a very very fantastic uh, uh day uh, it began so well that you know the, our students used to think that uh, isro is up in the space but here what they saw is dr vivian krishnamurthy has taken isro to the ground and shown the ground realities to students that that how it is helping and improving the life of the common man it is he mentioned that we graduated and made technical contributions and technologies and applications for making it useful for the common man and 
in that process we became best in the world these are the words of yvn krishnamurthy and when he talked about sustainable development i recalled in 1980s the team consisting of uh, krishnamurthy plus several others including dr jeraman who is present here with us they were leading a work of district collectors of 108 districts if i remember correctly this 108 districts were selected in the country to be to to showcase integrated integrated development which later grew much much bigger and became a uh, a, a role model for the entire world india so became a role model for integrated development for the whole world so krishnamurthy is very nicely narrated and made it very dissing so isro is not only in the space yes you are right it's in the space but isro is always on the ground learning from the life systems uh, and the uh, uh, and local wisdom and trying to apply it very very uh, uh, effectively and appropriately so it has been a very very nice talk and uh, i am i am extremely happy that dr krishnamurthy has come and talk very very uh, uh, pointedly and uh, focusing so well on what we wanted to hear so uh, thank you very much dr krishnamurthy jeram please go ahead uh, thank you sir uh, now it is uh, our turn to listen to dr ganesh raj on the environmental aspects of uh, indian remote sensing so i request uh, dr ganesh raj to take over and commence the session dr ganesh raj yeah, i am uh, just jayaram i am just uh, showing my presentation thank you yes, sir. thank you very much Ganesh, on the right hand side, this present now. If you click on that, you get three icon. Oh, In that, that. You use Windows, the middle one. Then it asks you to share. So you share your screen, uh, whatever is there. Presentation open. Yeah, we are able to see now. You can get into your presentation. Get in? Yeah, now you have to get your presentation. We are able to see your screen. Get into PowerPoint. Are we able to share, see my slide? No, no. You have to get your PowerPoint now. We are able to see your screen. Uh, sir, can you please tell me if you have presented your entire screen or have you clicked on a window? I have clicked on a window actually. Okay. Okay, sir. So you clicked on a window, and then I think you selected your Google Chrome browser. So you, if you select on window, and if you select a particular window, you will only be presenting that particular window. Okay. So from that list, if you click on your slides, you will be able to present that particular slide only. I mean that uh, PowerPoint file. Any issue, Doctor Ganesh Raj? No, just I uh, will come come back, sir. A minute.
Ganesh, you did the right thing only. We are able to see your screen. After that, you get into just log on to your PowerPoint on your bar, bottom bar. Scroll. And if you need to. Yeah, I'm able to click the slide. Come in? Yeah. Go into full slide mode. Yeah. Coming now, slide is in. Yeah, good, good. Please go ahead. Sorry for the some I think geek up, sir. So good afternoon to all uh, students and my senior colleagues uh, from ISRO, my colleagues and uh, UL Space Club uh, office bearers, especially Kuti sir and Saji and Jairaman. I am very happy that uh, all such an event is organized by UL Space Club. And uh, really, it is a great thing to have uh, interaction with all of you. And my colleague, Dr. Ivan Krishnamurthy, has presented very nicely about uh, how it is used for various applications and how we have gone to the ground and utilized it. I'll be mainly focusing on the environmental ecological aspects uh, with the more focus on Kerala specifically because most students are from Kerala. There's a beautiful uh, parody field uh, in uh, Kerala everywhere, mostly, of course, this is in Kasaragod. And coming to our uh, topic of this uh, year, the World Space Week is very apt uh, for our founder, Vikram Sarabhai. We must be second to none, he has told, in application of advanced technologies to the real problems of man and society, which you find in our country. And to assure its development, India views science and space technology as a crucial apparatus for its socioeconomic development. It is true. India has used extensively the space technology, not only remote sensing satellites, communication satellites, navigation satellites for the development of the country, for unifying the country, to reaching to everybody. It may be television, it may be telephone, it may be internet services. All we were able to contribute because that's a technology and uh, it has helped people tremendously. Very apt topic and our uh, so Sarabhai's uh, dream is becoming uh, fulfilled. And this is just a we want to highlight what are the major advantages that Dr. Yuen Krishnamurti has already covered. I'll just reiterate, one is synoptic view, like bird's eye view, you are able to get for entire region. There's a major advantage of remote sensing from satellite or from other flat platforms. We are able to see a larger area in a single shot. Repeated available satellite data, then multi very high spatial resolution. Now we are able to see up to 25 centimeters from satellite and study possible to study inaccessible areas, stereo view, low cost, and less time. Here I will highlight uh, because I thought. Uh, study of the remote sensing or other resources. It provides reliable, timely, and unbiased information on land use, land cover, forest, corals, mangroves, snow, glaciers, like that, all the fields. It is possible to study local to global level. And we are able to get the aerial extent, type, condition, and other parameters very fast and less cost. Change and impact you can assess very effectively. You can regularly monitor. I'm audible now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Then where we can really use this? So we can uh, continuously monitor. We can manage the environment. Because of late, everybody is talking about uh, the concern of uh, protecting and conserving our environment. It may be forest. It may be hills. It may be water body, everything. It is possible. High resolution, multi-spectral, multi-sensor remote sensing data provides information on the impact of industries and other activities on land use land cover, soil, water bodies, groundwater, settlement, and many other parameters. Now we have satellites. On various scales, we can study from 2,000 to 1 million. Number of satellites, our own IRS, Resource sat, land sat, spot, plenty of satellites are available. 
then repeat cycles very few days to few weeks and 20 by centimeter to 10 centimeter spatial resolution that means the smallest object what you can see clearly and pick is of 20 by centimeter resolution bands in visible and microwave region because visible region we can we work sometime but sometimes when cloud is more we cannot use that we need microwave and stereo we and if it uh, certainly helps in various other like uh, flood modeling we need stereo view more detailed information you can collect from aerial photos airborne sensors and off-flight drones it has become uh, a buzzword now i will go with few examples like uh, national land use land cover mapping we are doing regularly it is uh, done for last 15 years continuously and if you see here the categories like kharif crop in uh, 14 15 it is 45.29 million hectares it has gone up to 20, 57 million hectares in 15-16. If similarly we have evergreen forest, no change as much. Deciduous forest, some change is there. Each class we can have that comparison. It's a faster mode on one lakh uh, or one uh, one is to two lakh fifty thousand scale. This map is prepared, and you can see snow cover. The change it has increased. So this information collected rapidly using coarse resolution data of AWIPS at 56 meter resolution provides valuable information for various decision making process. Coming to Kerala, let us see how the, our, our Kerala is, the God's own country. You can see 2005-6 what was Kerala's land use land cover. In 1819 what has happened? Built up means buildings that like if you see Trivandrum or Ernakulam, Kochi, like that. It was 0.35 lakh hectares. It has become 1.46 lakh hectares in 1819. A significant growth is there. Similarly, there's good growth in Rabi crop, but wasteland has come down. That's a good sign. 2.09 lakh hectares has become 0.6. It's a change we can assess. Because that shows how the information generated using satellite and ground-based information was is for development of the wastelands for bringing under land under proper cultivation or proper use. So a lot of things can be done. It is a very good example how the change have happened. At the same time, we can find our urban areas have grown so much because population has increased, the demand has increased. Coming to forest cover of India. That OUNK told in his talk clearly that initially the Forest Survey of India and ISRO were jointly doing now. Forest Survey of India regularly prepares map once in two years. The latest map of 2019. And a good uh, trend is that forest cover has marginally increased. In fact, uh, when it was prepared first in 1980, forest cover was only 19%. It is cover, it is not type actually, whether uh, like very dense forest, moderate dense forest, open forest like that. Now they add a tree cover, which is outside the forest. That also have 2.89%. So totally we have around 24% under 24.56% forest and tree cover. It's a good sign. And out of a total uh, geographic area of uh, 3.28 million hectares, and there is effort continuously to improve the forest cover. Coming to Kerala, what is the status? Kerala is one of the good states where good percentage of uh, area is under uh, forest and tree cover, almost 54.42%. Very dense forest is 4.98%. Moderate dense forest is 24.47%. Open forest, that is actually for trees outside the forest cover, is 24.97%. Really, that way, our state is good. It is really having a lot of uh, green cover. Mangroves, which is Kandal Kardigal, LR Karya Kandal Kardigal. India has large mangroves, especially in West Bengal. That is uh, Sundarbans, largest delta in the world. Then, of course, Gujarat has large number area under mangroves. We have Andaman Nicobar Island, then we have Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra, but Kerala also has 0.18%. It's really Good to know that because many people may think Kerala doesn't have mangroves. Mangroves are there in Kerala. Let us see where is that. 
Kerala is in Ernakulam, Kannur and Kasaro districts. More other districts, very less actually. So totally we have uh, in three districts around uh, 8.9 square kilometer under mangroves. And uh, you can see the mangroves of from Kerala further in Kannur, in uh, Ernakulam. But of course there is a lot of change. You can see 2002 pure mangrove growing area. Now it has become refineries and other things. You are aware of that. Coming to biodiversity. See, India is very rich in biodiversity. One of the richest in the world. Flora around 7%. Fauna around 6.5%. And uh, our Western Ghats, which Kerala is also part of that, is rich biodiversity hotspot. Western Himalayas, Andaman Nicobar, Eastern Ghats, and all those places are very rich in uh, biodiversity. And India is one of the first country to prepare a biodiversity characterization map and as a part of the biodiversity convention. It is a great, greatly enabled some planning, like Bombay Natural History planning to declare that uh, declared as Shivalik area as a bird site. And a lot of medicinal plants also identified. It is one of the rich information available on the biodiversity information system openly available websites. This is the real good contribution of the satellite technology for the biodiversity assessment. Coming to forest fire, which is very common. Now all may be reading about oh, California forest fire. So I'm not showing California, I'm showing Indian forest fires. We do have a lot of forest fires in deciduous type of forests, especially Nagarwale, Madhumalai, Bandipur in South and in Uttarakhand and Chhattisgarh forest. We have forest fire farm frequently. And this is a whole study. Dr. Egade, who is a part, part of this program, and myself and my, our team had prepared a fire risk zonation map for uh, these areas as a part of our uh, study of uh, integrated mission for sustainable development, what Kutisar also told, as well as what Dr. Ivenke also covered, prepared even forest fire risk assessment uh, maps also, where, the, where it is frequently occurring what measure they should take, how it can be managed. You can see the first picture without forest fire, next picture all burnt areas are clearly seen and these are basically ground fire and that catches to the trees later. And it is natural, it is not natural fire in India at all. It is man-made. It is either by miscreants, some villagers, like that they give fire and it spreads and damages a lot of forest areas. Coming to the latest uh, or that big year beginning forest in Australia. You may be knowing it has spread one of the widest and uh, largest forest fire. And they tell even 300 million species have died like that. Because this is this caused severe damage to the Australian uh, eco ecology and environment. One of the worst fires. Coming to vegetation change assessment. See, a lot of people talk about uh, the vegetation cover in urban areas. What's happening? We see trees cut, some building is coming, road is widened. What is the real status of the vegetation? It may be a tree, it may be a grassland, or it may be a weed in a lake or anything. So we took up a study for Bengaluru because there is the impression that mangrove vegetation is almost gone. Some studies even showed that mangrove doesn't have vegetation except 5% only. But the good thing happened is uh, when we studied, we found that in the last 13 years, our uh, bank still has 26% on a tree cover. Not only other uh, grassland or anything or any, what they call weed in the lake, etc. Tree cover itself is 26%. We lost around 4% from 2006. How we lost? This is the bottom picture here. There is a plantation on Kanakapura Road. That has become a huge complex now, a housing complex. Similarly, if you see here, this is actually one of the famous road in uh, South Bangalore. That is RV road with both sides having a good uh, tree cover. But due to metro work, it has lost vegetation. But at the same time, we have retained vegetation. This is the Ibaluru forest area, which was scattered and thin. Now it has been densified. This is that uh, our layout 
away from the ring road. Actually, here what happened? The layout time, there is a lot of damages caused to the agriculture area. It is not a plantation area at all, or trees are. But now they have a beautiful uh, palm tree and other trees, palm tree restored history. So there is a trend of both positive and negative. This study showed that we do have a lot of vegetation still existing and people love to grow more and more trees either in lawns, in their uh, areas, old uh, settlements. So there is a good trend of increased vegetation, really a heartening to note. Coming to mining, it's one of the most uh, devastating thing happened. You are aware, large area damage has been caused. This is the classic example of Sandur in Karnataka, the Bellari, where the iron ore mining is going on, open cast. In 2003, if you see only this much, in April 2019, it has spread and it has spread wide and deep, causing severe damage to the the surrounding environment, the Nariella Dam got totally silted. Of course, after the Supreme Court order is there, they stopped mining in this area, but it has caused severe damage to the environment already. Coming to our own Kerala, there is mining. Some people may be knowing a China clay mines near Trivandrum. You see here, in 2003, it was a small mining area. Now it has become big. Mining has gone very deep also. It has become a big water body here even here also. So mining and quarrying has caused severe damage, a severe problem to the environment in many parts because most of them does not adhere to the norms prescribed that they should not go this much deep, they should do like that because they always go more and more deep and more and more wide to excavate and get material which is in great demand. So regulated mining is one solution where we can really manage satellite images multi-date gives a very good information about mining activities coming to glaciers you all may be knowing that our himalayas is the third pole outside uh, north and south pole but uh, at the same time you're all aware that a lot of glaciers and snow is melting and the himalaya is having uh, the less coverage cover of glaciers and the snow so a study has been taken up because this is one of the most inaccessible area. We cannot really go everywhere. So satellite technology proves to be one of the best way of managing uh, or mapping the glaciers. I am audible now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely, sir. Okay, okay. Because I, I thought not. Uh, otherwise, uh, I'll be uh, doing a monologue. That's why. So this is the one classic example mapping of glaciers. And it was done for entire Himalayan region. And later, some selected uh, glaciers, the retreat was studied. This one classic example of Samudra. Glacier. If you see the different white, this white line 1962, the glacier was, you see, in 2006, somewhere it is here. This much retreat has happened. You see, even here, the area of the glacier loss in the area. So that shows that, the satellite image also shown here, that shows that due to climatic changes, it may be anthropogenic or it may be natural. That is not really proved that uh, this only is causing problem. It has caused retreat of glaciers. So it has caused in way a ecological impact on the Himalayan terrain. Coming to the pollution, especially air pollution, you are aware Air pollution is caused by anthropogenic activities, but here this is caused by volcanic eruption. The sulfur dioxide rich, the emission had caused severe traffic, air traffic effect across Europe. And recently Indonesia also happened. Such a thick cloud of sulfur and sulfur dioxide. In fact, in 1992, I remember the Pinatobo a volcanic eruption along with a lot of chain of eruptions had erupted so much sulfur and uh, sulfur dioxide atmosphere the temperature came down for a while of the entire but global cooling took place then global warming so this is the one way satellite image can be easily used for understanding the air air, air pollution 
or the plumes coming out from volcanoes, etc. Coming to this one, all you people are aware that is in the, especially November, December, Jan, like that, it comes in paper regularly. The smog, the residue burning in Punjab, Haryana, causing problem along with the fog, the North Indian Indo Gangetic Plain. This from Modi's data. We can really map it now, but we have got a better satellite that is Sentinel 5P, which has a sensor called Tropomi, most advanced multispectral imaging spectrometer to date it is. Because air pollution is a serious concern. Large number of people get affected due to air pollution. How to study that? We need dedicated satellites. This Sentinel 5 precursor and the going to come Sentinel 5 is the effort of ESA, European Space Agency, in this direction. These are things they are going to monitor, very useful one. And studies, what we have done, we compared with the ground based data also. Bangalore, and we found that there's a good correlation between the satellite observations and uh, ground based observations. The ground observations, the stations are Bangalore has only 13 stations, automatic coverage stations. They do not touch it everywhere, all over India and 240 stations. So, air pollution, we cannot get for all the areas easily. So, this is one solution which helps us to understand the air pollution anywhere. That is the real use of this Sentinel 5P. This example of Bellari, what you have done, you can see it is very high NO2. Why it is very high? When you check the satellite image, we found there is a thermal power station, there is a steel plant, both are contributing for the increased NO2. The study done during uh, that our COVID lockdown showed significant reduction in a way that. Uh, NO2, SO2, etc. on Delhi and many other cities due to reduced vehicular pollution also, vehicular running. Coming to water, all of you are aware about Namami Ganga. But uh, to fact, to uh, the fact is, it is not only Ganga, it is Kaveri, it may be Periyar, it may be Pamba, it may be Chandragiri. Most rivers are becoming polluted if they are very close to city. This worst case. You know, Bangalore, we have a river called Prashabhavati. Name is very nice, but it is highly polluted and contaminated. Even Trivandrum city also have some streams like that. This study we did, especially for Kaveri, from Krishna Sagar Dam to Satyagala, to know what is the impact of urbanization, industrialization, and agriculture on river pollution. We use satellite of 1990 and 2019 to understand how much population has increased. Unfortunately, we got good uh, ground based uh, water sample analysis from uh, various sources, which showed clearly increase in BOD and coliform bacteria in the recent years. And if you see the down pictures of the sewage is entering uh, to the river directly near Bannur, one village, and here how people are using for washing all those things. So, rivers are becoming more and more polluted. And effort is required by governments and all of us not to pollute the river first. And if it is polluted, how to manage it? So there is a real effort is required. Otherwise, it is going to be disastrous. Coming to lakes or water bodies, we have a large number of lakes in Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, Andhra, all the states, because dry districts water is stored in lakes or tanks. Most of them are man-made. It is not uh, natural uh, depressions. So Bangalore had large number of lakes. A study was taken up at the request of Karnataka Lake Conservation and Development Authority using the uh, American satellite Corona. It is not the coronavirus. It is basically the Corona satellite, uh, which is data is available made freely to anybody you can download. So that we found at the time 484 lakes were there in 1965 in Bangalore and surrounding area. But 
in 2017 data when you checked carter said list four data the number has come down to 407 especially in the core city area there is a large reduction of lakes we have lost around 86 lakes here but 10 new lakes in Banegata and some areas have been constructed so the loss is mainly to due to converted into bus stands stadiums layouts like that the existing lakes also have become the sewage carriers as than anything else but there is a effort now by government sewage plants are being set up so if we were to revive these lakes are there for last many years and i'm sure that some result will come and you will have more clean and clear lakes this example how this chalagatta lake has become a golf course then bilakanali lake has become a jp nagar fourth phase a classic example coming to coast studies the coast is very vast even kerala kerala has around a 600 km long coast how will you study coast wetlands coast wetlands shoreline changes coral reefs all things we should study means satellite technology is one of the best way we have prepared a coastal uh, zone maps for entire country of 7500 km length coast coral reef maps have been prepared coastal regulation zone input has been provided this, this example i'm showing you the dense mangroves tidal flats corals aquaculture ponds all those things a classic example for kasaragod i did there i was i did study i'm showing here 1994 the spits you can see how it is and uh, how it has changed but after construction of this uh, arbor a fishing arbor with the structure here the spit shape totally changed become very wide and there's a lot of change erosion has taken place here so we can monitor this uh, any area coastal area very easily and most of this data what i'm showing you here are open source you can see yourself and analyze this is an example of kochi and surroundings in 2005 the image i showed you already what happened in 2019 a lot of changes development at what cost that's the concern this again uh, my last slide but the mangrove area if you see some buildings are coming here so what happened if you allow urbanization unhindered you may lose all this precious ecology and environment and impact will be long term what you faced many times. Thank you, Kavini. I think uh, open to any questions. Uh, thank thanks. You, I think it's, uh, if uh, nothing more, we, we can go. We, I'll ask my student fellows to just uh, start the question and session. You can ask questions to Dr. Vaivyan as well as Ganesh Raj, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, I think I am audible and visible, right? Yeah. Yes, please okay. go ahead. Thank you so much. It has been uh, a very beautiful one and a half hours to be listening to the likes of Dr. Vaivyan Krishnamurti and Dr. K. Ganesh Raj. Uh, me and Adil here today are extremely excited and honored to be interacting with the two of you. Uh, we have been able to interact with uh, the likes of you for uh, a, a few times already. And we have understood how important you are in India's space programs. Um, with Dr. Vaivin Krishnamurti is in fact an important person in refining, filtering and channeling the best talents in, into the Indian Space Research Organization through the Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology, Tiruvandapuram. And Dr. K. Ganesh Raj is in fact a manifest station of Dr. Vikram Sarabhai's dreams and I of the Indian space program. So without uh, uh, further ado, let me please uh, move Watch on to the Q&A session. And uh, uh, to begin with, let me uh, share the responsibilities with Adil and let him begin with the first question. Thank you, Baron. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I uh, thank Krishnamurti sir and Ganesha sir for excellent presentation. I really like that session 
I'm really waiting for such a uh, such an on remote sensing satellites. And I would like to start uh, with my first question. I don't know why my camera isn't working. I switched it on, but it's not working. I'm sorry about that. Uh, Adil, you have to be a little louder. <laughs> Sir, can you hear? Adil? Yeah. Adil, also, also uh, please tell whom the question is addressed. Oh, OK. OK, sir. No, it's OK. We're, one of us will answer. Don't worry. Yeah, huh? I, will, <laughs> I don't know. How... <laughs> you have to be a little louder, Adil. We are not able to listen to you properly. OK, sir. Uh, let me okay. check. Is, that, is, uh, is it audible now, sir? Yeah, yeah. OK, sir. So uh, my first question is, um, we, we all know that remote sensing satellites are economic development. Uh, even though India managed to uh, launch highly efficient and technologically development, developed satellites within a, a low budget, what is the success mantra of India behind this achievement? Yeah. <clears throat> See, uh, I will take this uh, question, Ganesh. Okay, See, first of all, we should understand that satellites we didn't do because we can do. These all evolved with the system <clears throat> because basically we looked at what the user needs are. Okay, very specifically, that's where we had the National Natural Resources Management System. In each each of the ministries, that's where uh, last time also just briefly I mentioned that because of uh, our Satish Davanji, uh, <clears throat> the second chairman of ISRO, he has made this preparatory. Committee on National Natural Resources Management System. See the topic you kindly see. We are not relating to satellites. We are talking about National Natural Resources Management System that is related to the sustainable development, right? So this is where he looked at from each of the ministries. If you want to have a good natural resources, which are not degrading, if it is degrading, the poverty levels also will increase. So that is the concept. So to do the best of the natural na natural resources management. Which are the ministries responsible for water? Which is the ministry for soils, for minerals, agriculture? So there's a standing committees have been made. And they have told what are the inputs, information they need, and what are the gaps today in their information collection, how satellites can help them. That's how the teams which has been there for designing and making the satellites are very clear that we need to have satellites of the best of the resolution. But also we need some preter imaging because every time the users cannot buy such expensive data. So that's where large swath that made the advantage to cover large area. That's where I showed you an image how you can cover one district and how you can cover the entire state or how you can con convert this thing. So the low cost, I don't care low cost. We have optimized in such a way that it will all be less cost than whatever uh, is uh, expected about. So it's an evolved system. It is not just. We want to do something, we do it. No, it's an evolved system with holding hands with the user and keep on improving on it so that it meets the requirement with the less cost. And that is where, and then we have a, luckily in India, what happens is we have an access to the farmer. How it is using us, it is not with the ministry, as I told you. We know there are many farmers' names in which who exactly is using what, what is his feedback, what is the next level which we had to do. So that's where we also need to look, look into how well we have to add some value for the satellite data and information we do. So it will be useful for the people. That's where the success story of ISRO. And it is not alone. It is a teamwork. And uh, ISRO works on teamwork. Okay, There are, suppose when you tell integrated mission, so we need the specialists from different disciplines, from geology, from soils, from agriculture. So all people put together, they give you the, finally the information and that's where we are able to speak to people speak to administrators speak to the parliamentarians convince them so these are different uh, at different levels we need to handle and that could be successfully done and we are able to answer most of the questions what the parliamentarians also ask when they visit our facilities i hope uh, this answer meets your requirement uh, yes sir it was perfect Thank you, Adil. In fact, I am extremely uh, thankful to Adil for asking this particular question, because even though uh, we are not in the most promising of conditions around us, um, even in the most adverse of conditions, uh, this is something that makes us feel proud to be Indians ourselves. So let's try to 
to channelize this particular discussion into uh, the topic of remote sensing itself. So uh, when it comes to remote sensing, we've heard of two important techniques, which are radar imagery and optical imagery. So can you please tell us the most important differences between them and the advantages of one over the other? And please do tell us some examples of satellites with, uh, which are using these technologies and if there are any satellites which use a combination of both technologies. Yeah. Shall I take Ganesh or you would like to answer? No problem. Okay. Sure. <laughs> so we have, as I told you, the optical imaging uh, in the wavelengths. Okay. When we have the large, larger the uh, wavelength, you can penetrate. Okay. So we have the RSAT series, which I was mentioning, both in C band and X band. We have an experience in looking at. So they are all weather capability because these are called active payloads. Whereas uh, the optical things which you are talking about are all passive. That means they use sun's electromagnetic radiation. So at a particular time when they image, so whatever the uh, um, radiation which falls on the surface or the objects, how much is reflected and how much reaches back the sensor, that is what is being detected and that's what we use. So these are all called passive sensors. Whereas the radars are active sensors, that means they send their own pulse and look at how it interacts with the features or the uh, objects and what reflect and what returns back the pulse and that we try to analyze but the optical is easy to understand because it looks like the way we see though we go into the near infrared or short wave infrared or to a certain extent thermal extent the features the object size shape everything is uh, somewhere relevant you can connect immediately but in the radar what happens is when it goes below the surface so it's very difficult to understand uh, the location unless you have certain processing techniques. So processing of the data for uh, radar imaging is a little more complex. But it gives you the information on soil moisture in C-band or and a combination. There's a combination of making a hybrid images with uh, optical and radar to make certain interpretations or certain mineral prospecting wherever we want to do the radar images played a better role than the optical imaging per se. But then of course, the hyperspectral will have a little more edge while talking about the mineral, mineral, mineral prospecting. Then we are having also a little larger wavelengths. We are going to L and S band. So these are going to give really a breakthrough. Suppose L band, when it has been used in uh, certain deserts, the paleo channels of Nile uh, could be easily identified. But the same thing we could not really get in our Thar Desert because Thar Desert has already a little amount of moisture. It is not really so desert as what we look at uh, Sahara and other places. So there is, we, we could not get much. But then the paleo channels of uh, lost uh, Saraswati could be successfully mapped with the combination of optical and also the microwave uh, remote sensing. So these paleo channels are useful for two things. One is not for water alone. So these placer deposits will like gold or diamonds. The source can be somewhere, but these need not go washed along with the active stream which is existing today. They have been washed and then the paleo channel areas, they are abundantly available. So there are a multiple uses of uh, the, the radar and optical, but for us to easily to understand if you are making a hybrid, it will come to a common man's understanding. Today, satellite images, Google images, images on Bowen, everyone looks at and comes closer. Oh, this is my house, this is my street, or this is my agricultural land. Okay, this is what is the sheet erosion happening in my area. So when you're communicating yourself or connecting with something, the radar images is not so easy. That's where we need to make a hybrid of it if you want to really understand. But there are a lot of uh, process complexities in terms of polarimetry and all. Uh, which can take to a higher size. This is where the opportunities for youngsters like you is in image processing, both in optical and also the active uh, remote sensing, where the noise which comes in, how to minimize the noise, extract the best of the signal. So there are ample opportunities uh, for each one of you because both the sources are available from uh, same uh, institution, ISRO. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Adil. Over to you. Yeah, only one point I will just mention. It also penetrates the cloud. 
because larger wavelength. So even when there's a cloud, you can get an image. Whereas in optical, when cloud is there, you don't get the information, right? So you can get all weather uh, information. So you can operate at any time of the day, night, and you can get the information in radar imaging. Whereas optical, it's not possible. Hmm? So, uh, sir, are you talking? Uh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, there is a, a little bit of a doubt that I have. Uh, is it like uh, optical, uh, you know, instruments just receive visible spectrum, or do they, uh, you know, pictureize using other wavelengths as well? No, no, I mentioned to you, no, invisible and also in infrared, short wave infrared, and certain passive thermal, we can do the imaging, right? So these are all the optical imaging uh, which can be done. And uh, each one has its own uh, signature specific to different objects uh, which we'll have, right? So you're seeing beyond your normal visible part what a human eye can see. Human eye can see from 0.4 to 0.7 microns, whereas the other range, like infrared and all, has to be looked from these kind of satellites. Thank you, sir. Oh, uh, so let me move on to my next question, uh, my question. Uh, sir, uh, India stepped on to uh, remote sensing uh, on 1988 by launching IRS-19. So I'm pretty sure it uh, influenced its source later on projects. So my question is, uh, how was uh, IRS-19 affected or influenced its source later on satellite development? Now, your question, if I understood, in 1988, we launched our first satellite IRS-1, how it has been utilized? Uh, so my question is, uh, how uh, it influenced the uh, ISRO's later on satellite development? Yeah, yeah. First of all, one of our satellite development, first every satellite, any developer, technology developer, will be very keen to know how it is being used. Okay? See, IRS 1A 1988 has two payloads called LIS-1 and LIS-2. Okay? So that time the planning commission, when they are making a planning process, they would like to know how much is in Karif, how much is in Rabi, how much is in double crop, how much is in fallows. The fallows also has a two criteria. That is called uh, residual fallows and uh, permanent fallows. Permanent fallows means more than five years. If the agricultural land is not used, that's called permanent fallows. So to do this, we did it through the IRS one year satellite data for entire country. Certain things through digital methods and certain things too visual methods. Someone is asking on AI and other uh, techniques. At that time itself, in 1989-90 period, when the data when we are using digital methods, we use rule-based logic, very primitive way, but to see that no information is misclassified. That means if you find, uh, if you want to really know what happened in a particular pixel, what type of uh, land use it is, so we try to relate it with the summer and the Karif and Rabi. Karif is uh, the most of the rain fed agriculture. The Rabi is the winter crops and uh, the summer crops. So all the three satellite images, the whatever the classification, digital classification methods called supervised classification, where you give the ground root and do the classification is a statistical method uh, using a priori probability, which we map. But on top of it, uh, based on the rule based logic, each pixel output has been verified. And to that accuracy, we could do, because for example, I'll tell you a very simple example. If there's a forest, that's also visitation, and there's a plantation outside the forest, that's also will be of a almost matching signature some places. So we had to be very careful. We are talking about a visitation somewhere in the forest or its side. So we adopted some stratified technologies uh, separately to classify the forest separately, non-forest area separately. Then in the non-forest areas, whether something is a grassland, a wasteland, or called as an open scrub, or it's an agricultural land. So we adopted many techniques. So that was really useful for the planning commission. So they, that gave a boost to all the scientists and technologies to make the next level. But it doesn't mean that we, unless this output comes, we don't start the next. But the planning for IRS 1C has happened almost parallel before. But then the country needs to have something in hand this is one of the input which they, the Air 12 Planning Commission wanted to make agro-climatic zonal zone wise planning. And that was a ready-made input uh, which could be available in a turnaround time of around 12 months by various uh, institutions uh, across the country. So by the time we are ready for IRS 1C. 
Okay, so that is how the system, the, the moment in 1995 when we got this IRS 1C data, so we went to the next phase. So we want 5.8 meter resolution in panchromatic and we have a multispectral, but we can make this to a combination where you can make a color uh, information to go to the users and show how does the drainage look like or how is that a watershed program. Suppose you want to treat something like 1000 to 5000 uh, hectares of an area, is there any way to do? So we are talking about the next level. We are talking first is a gross level, it's a district level. What is the different type of land use which you can assess? Then the second level, you are able to go connect to a, a group of villages uh, with 5.8 meter resolution, which was never available to the civilian use. In 1995, India is the first country to release it for the civilian use. And then it also shows entire state and uh, district what is happening. What is the change happening every five days? So that's very that was very very interesting for the people to catch up, and we could to have a dialogue and discussion. And also for geotechnical aspects, I was telling you the reconnaissance surveys for any geotechnical surveys because you for a larger area synoptic view, all the components of remote sensing were handled by IRS ones. And then of course we had IRS one D. So in tandem, instead of five days repetitivity, we could get every second or third day repetitivity of the given area. So temporal resolution improved. So this all, whatever we speak on book is available, we are making available for the user and then making him understand how to utilize it. So that's, the, that's how it evolves and gets into the system because any technology to get assimilated into a system, it takes time. So meanwhile, how do you do our groundwork in showing what is needed by the user how quickly you do some value addition and meet his requirements that makes the strength. That's how the application scientists at NRSC, regional remote sensing centers and space application center and to also IARS in Dehradun. So all these people contributed to this. Thank you, sir. Very, it was very clear, sir. Yeah. And uh, from uh, from what you said, we re, uh, we can... Actually, my senior or boss, Jairaman Saab, is hearing us. So if he has any, because he is the... And one who actually was the brain behind all these NNRMS, okay? And then to take it forward. Uh, if I missed any point, you can always add, and it will be a pleasure to hear him always. Okay, sir. So, IRS one day was a milestone in yes. ISRO's history, as you said. And uh, it's developed a lot. And uh, I, have, I, I, uh, I would like to ask about a future mission. Uh, NISAR, we heard of uh, NISAR and otherwise it's called uh, NASA ISRO Synthetic Aperture Radar uh, and joint venture by ISRO and NASA and plan to be launched on 20, uh, 20, 2022 and we heard that it was it will be the most expensive satellite sir I would like to ask why it is so expensive <laughs> So, no, no, actually any radar imaging is a little expensive than the optical one. And this is a complex mission because for a, a satellite mission, because people did something on uh, space shuttle, certain spatial imaging and things like that and tried. But then this as an operational satellite to make uh, both an L and S band is a, a very good attempt. And then it's a knowledge sharing and at equal footing uh, means in technology wise. Uh, which we are developing it and this and ISRO has a one uh, advantage whatever we try to do in space we do on aerial first so already l and s band aerial has been flown by the payloads have been made by space application center and that has been flown and the users have a first hand input on how this data see one is making a technology however expensive it is expensive because the complicated complexity in the technology or else many other countries would have done we might have seen small satellites, these satellites, so many satellites are coming, but most of the people are operating in optical. But in uh, in microwave, there are certain countries which are done in ERS and other satellites earlier. And today also we have in Sentinel certain payloads which are available. But then when you come to an operational satellite of that nature with the type of details which you are trying to capture, it's complex. That's where we came together as a collaborative uh, exercise. But then the utility part of it, see it's one is launching a satellite is great. But how to utilize, how to train the users to be ready to use the data. This is where we start with uh, aerial sorties. Even for hyperspectral, we do aerial sorties. But that time, hyperspectral aerial is not available with us. So we got from uh, JPL, uh, the payload called Average. And then we've flown in many of the sites. 
So the, by the time we flown, uh, made our own satellite for hyperspectral remote sensing, our colleagues, uh, means scientists in ISRO and also other ministries, were ready to utilize the data. So you had to prepare. Well, don't look at the cost part of it. Actually, cost-wise, it may be expensive than the optical, but it is that is not the first uh, concern here. How do we make uh, people to understand and efficiently use within the lifetime of the satellite? That is most important. Thank you, Jay, sir. Jay, hello, hello. Uh, may may interrupt hello, sir, for yes, a moment. Yes, sir, yes, may sir. interrupt, Jeram. May interrupt for a moment. Uh, Sir. Vijay is here, you know, our Vijay, our Dr. Vijay Ram is here and uh, um, uh, Krishnamurthy tried to cox him. I will also make uh, an attempt for Mr. Jairam to just say a few words. Dr. Jairam, please. Jai. Hello, are you able to hear me? Yeah, we are, we are hearing you, we are hearing you. So, well, I will so only listen to my people, I, say, I, I don't want to interact immediately because they are talking very well and everybody is appreciating that. That, that is a good thing. And of course, I do. Sh I should say always that it is an evolving process as the Dr. Krishnamurti was mentioning. In those days, 30 years back, the technology was like that. One pixel was really equal to 50, 60 meters on the ground. The 60 meters, you are talking about 200 feet. One pixel, one dot in the ground is 200 feet. So in 200 feet, whatever you are seeing is integrated and given as a single pixel. That was the technology available at that time. Today, we are able to see 30 centimeters and better than 30 centimeters in the civilian domain. I add the word civilian because we do not know the strategy sector, what Americans have done or Russians have done. They would have got six centimeters probably. Okay. So today they can read the car number plate from satellite easily. Okay. And you can see videos are being made from satellite itself. There are many more advantages. Obviously, the problem is data analytics. How do you get the data analyzed properly for natural resources? Whatever statistical method we are using earlier, the maximum likelihood classifier, all that we talked about those days, are now more valid today. Okay, So things are changing. Data analytics is becoming a very important element, integrating AI, deep learning, etc. I think that is the part our youngsters should concentrate on the ground side, because somebody asked about the cost of visa. I don't know the real cost of visa. Some paper news are there only. only. India does not spend that much time, that much money. Our s banks are not be costing that money. And also when they say any mission cost, it is not just satellite. Please understand. It includes launch vehicle. It includes a complete ground network, complete network, global network for NISA. Everything is included in that. When they project a cost from America, Indian costs are much lower than that. Okay, please don't be carried away by the paper news about the cost of a satellite. And uh, benefits as what as Krishnamurti was mentioning, very very important. The benefit to cost ratio is always more than ten or so in remote sensing. And uh, Ganesh Raj explains nicely about the environmental degradation. If you are able to catch it younger, catch it earlier, you can do a lot of correction, course correction. So that is where remote sensing helps you. And tomorrow, or day of tomorrow, when Dr. Agade is going to talk about the disaster risk reduction, you know how do you really evaluate a satellite data in terms of life cost. You will not even know if some life is lost, one person loses his life, what is the cost of that life? So if you are able to predict early, that much saving is there in terms of livelihood and people's life also. I think it is a very complex equation. You can't simplify with just the pricing and costing. So that's what I, at the moment, anything is there, further I will interact. Thank you. Th thank you, Jay. It is uh, for my dear students, you are listening to Dr. Vivian Krishnamurthy, uh, Dr. Ganesh Raj, and now you are fortunate to listen to Dr. V. Jairaman for a short while. You must know that the first generation remote sensing scientists of the country belong to Jairaman Stein. Jairaman is one of the leaders in that group. And I won't say uh, Ivian Krishnamurthy second generation, but he just followed that. And uh, Dr. Ganesh Raj also belonged to that. And Jairaman led a very strong team, number wise, quality wise, and quantity wise, a very strong team in the country in, remote, in leading the remote sensing 
uh, efforts of the country. He was the director, National Remote Sensing Center, Hyderabad, uh, with, with more than 1,000 uh, people. And uh, of course, he was succeeded by Dr. Vivian Krishnamurthy later. And you know, you are fortunate to listen to such kind of stall words. You know, from their mouth, you are listening about the countries benefit satellites how satellite is improving the life the uh, the theme of the uh, world space week so thank you jay thank you YVNK. thank you ganesh raj thank you very much thank you sir thank you uh, v jayraman sir what i actually understand from what you said is that the saying that somebody is always watching you from the top is now becoming a bad truth and it is a little bit difficult to appreciate that uh, so uh, coming back to our discussion, uh, we were speaking about NISA, right? So uh, yesterday when we were discussing about NISA and we, we found out that NISA uh, was to be the first radar imaging satellite uh, which would use a dual band transmission. And uh, I've heard that dual band being has been extremely advantageous in GPS and other sorts of uh, positioning systems. So we would like to know how dual band transmission improves navigation systems. And uh, how does this particular technology help benefit remote sensing with special reference to NISA? Yeah, normally, see, you should not get confused with uh, the navigation part of it. Here, we are talking about two frequencies. Normally, if you tell RISAT, it's operating on C band. Or we had another RISAT one with X band. But here, we are doing with the L and S band. That means in two bands, they're operating on the SAM satellite. So these are active, active and active in the sense it needs to send its own pulse. And also it needs to receive that pulse in two frequencies, L and S band. Okay, that's what is the dual uh, frequency in which is going to operate. And the satellite is moving and earth is moving. And you have to get the information without any interferences. See, please understand, whenever you're operating in two frequencies, there is every chance of an interference. So parallelly, when you have to do, you have to see how these interferences are not caused when uh, active sensing is being done and also being uh, received and get best of the signal. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, uh, so let me ask a question. Let me ask another question. Uh, we know OceanSat is the first satellite built for ocean observation. And so I'm really curious to know about its main achievements and improvements uh, to our view over ocean uh, due to that satellite and type of study, studies that satellite conducted. See, the ocean sat is basically for ocean color <coughs> observation. So for example, you go into the ocean, do you see the blue, blue green algae floating there? We cannot see blue green algae floating there. If you ever, did you ever go into the ocean a little bit, into the sea in a, in a, in a, in a boat or any time? You may not have seen, okay? Because there is a certain amount of scattering, but then you have to make in 500 kilometers orbit a satellite to pick up this signature, which is very feeble, okay? And also it has to minimize the scattering, which is happening in that blue part of it. Blue part of it, because of the Raleigh scattering, whatever is happening, we have to minimize it and then get the best of the uh, signal, which is leaving the water. That is a, uh, that's where it has eight bands. It is not the normal, uh, this thing that oceans had one and two, they had eight bands in which there are certain bands to correct the signal and get the best of the water leaving radiation, radiance, that's what it's called. So based on that, we are able to get the blue green algae and the chlorophyll, which is floating on the water. And that becomes a friend and that friends are where the fish, which feeds on this. And subsequently, by the ocean side too, when it has come, we looked into, there are certain fishes like tuna, which feed on these kind of fishes. So we are able to get another modeling done. This also goes, so you have to do some, it is not a direct interpretation of images. There are certain algorithms which has been developed. Quite a good amount of sea truth has been done. The signature library has been developed. And based on that, the algorithms have been developed. So we are able to confidently tell the fisherman exactly based on this front, where exactly they should go for fishing. Okay, that means in which direction and how much distance from this fishing boat. That is the information which will come under is uh, in the fishing harbor. There's a display board 
uh, kept there in the local language and also in symbols because all fishermen may not uh, able to read so at least with the symbols they are able to go and get in the in the fishing resources whatever is the requirement but then there is some like yellow substance that means there is lot of material which goes down the sea and then in uh, upwelling it comes out which will become toxic so the actually the fish will not be there so that also we can detect from uh, these uh, ocean sat satellites so that is where to tell fishermen not to go in that area because they will not get any fish at all so the area of search has been reduced because the ocean is very big and then they are able to get to the location uh, where they are able to get uh, uh, to an accuracy the fishing and then fuel so that's where i told you 35000 uh, crores of rupees per annum is being saved uh, for the benefit of the country and getting the best results because the fisherman is able to go there and then get his yield but then that is not the only information we need sea surface temperature that we are operating from another set of satellites which are available globally and but then in ocean sat 3 which we are going to launch we are going to have uh, ocean color payload with 11 bands improved version every time we keep that's where i was telling evolving improving we are not the same we keep on improving improving that's where we have the dialogues with the users they will tell us okay we need some more inputs on this so one is we are talking about uh, both uh, uh, ephemeral and demersal fishes okay there are two different type of fishes how how we can one is associated with on the surface whatever it exists on the ocean surface the to feed uh, and then something which is underneath which also feeds on this fish so both of the things how to develop algorithms so you have sea surface temperature you have the ocean color and also scattermeter which tells about the wind vectors because these are dynamic so they're not static this uh, pool which is there so how it is moving if you go for seven days fishing how it will move and go so with the scattermeter in the wind vectors we are able to tell the next that is where we put our uh, navic receivers to give that messaging services to this fisherman who are all on this so your challenge is you don't do anything for india because there some agency doing for it learn here go across the world there's a global mission it's a challenge become an entrepreneur and do in different other oceans and showcase the ocean sat 3 data how it will be useful learn from ocean sat 2 and 1 what are the historical information and become your become an entrepreneur by yourself and this is what last time also i challenged you all if i was 10 years younger i would not have sat in this chair okay i would have been along with you a team of guys and then venture uh, into these things these are really good entrepreneurship opportunities and not only in the developing countries but also in the developed countries you can these use these payloads very effectively because the type of heterogeneity what you see in indian seas seas because arabian sea versus uh, bay of bengal and also in the indian ocean the things are having variability if you are able to capture that develop good algorithms and then also develop certain techniques by which because you have a historical data so it is possible how each of the location is changing on the radiance values with the set uh, gain and bias setting of the payload and that if you are able to capture you can bring in good ai based uh, algorithms which will be much much useful and it will be cost effective in giving solutions mm, nice thank you so much sir okay adil uh, is it my bharat bharat adil okay sir are we going a little bit out of time sir i think it is already 5:10 yeah, yeah. no no okay. just discuss and how many more questions you see uh, i think we have a few more questions sir, around five more yeah. questions left hello excuse me sir i think we have uh, five more questions or something left sir one moment one moment please hold on Vivian K sir, Ganesh Raj sir, will you be comfortable to spend another fifteen minutes with us? Yeah, yeah. Let them ask all the five questions, so we will combine. Yeah. <laughs> fine, fine. Go ahead, but uh, but make it fast. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, next question is about uh, an ISRO mission whose name I found to be extremely attractive, which is uh, the Mega Tropicus, and uh, which is a collaborative effort of ISRO and CNES of France. it is something different which studies the water cycle in tropical atmosphere in context of climate change uh, the question is that our understanding of the radiative and hydrological consequences of a moist atmosphere 
associated with a uh, warmer climate is still fraught with uncertainty. How does uh, Mega Tropicus help us for this mess? It would be extremely helpful if you could give us a slight description of this particular mission along with your answer as well. Yeah, the next step. Excuse yeah. me, sir. Okay, sir. The next question is, in fact, Adil's. You can ask it. Adil? Yes, sir, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, sir. Sir, this is a pretty much direct question. Uh, why does healthy plant canopies reflect so much infrared energy? This was a healthy? Healthy plant canopies reflect so much infrared energy. Okay. Fine. Next. Okay, sir. Uh, the next question is uh, kind of into the applications of remote sensing. Uh, we've all heard about uh, or, uh, or may have at least tried to use ISRO's Bowen app, but uh, the general public doesn't completely know about the features that the, pro, uh, the, that the platform provides. In fact, in the chat box, uh, there was one question from uh, Abhiram who uh, asked about how we could increase access to uh, you know the uh, welfare activities that ISRO provides. Uh, please, can you please uh, give us a brief info or intro about this particular platform of ISRO and how much it has helped us in agriculture, fishing, disaster management, and can you please tell us about the unseen potential that it has and that the public are still unaware of? Okay. Uh, can we move to the next question, sir? Yeah. Okay, sir. So the next question is also pretty straightforward. Over the past few years, a devastating amount of vegetation has been wiped off from the surface of the earth. Uh, this has indeed proved to be a global issue, which is worsening every day with the weather and the climate becoming too unpredictable day by day and nature losing its balance. Uh, so how much can the eye in the sky help, but help us out in this regard from the detection of anthropogenic activities uh, and its adverse effects to comparing the situation between uh, previous years and uh, you know living in this world of uncertainty how much has this particular eye in the sky helped us in detecting anthropogenic activities and uh, the adverse effect that it has we could uh, probably give reference to the kerala floods the california forest fires and the clearing of amazon uh, the recent tropical cyclones in the subcontinent and all these kinds of things uh, when you try to answer this question sir okay uh, okay, sir. So that last question uh, is that remote sensing has been uh, very crucial in national security and defense. So the question is that how much it has helped India in the past and how much it is helping us in this present scenario. What specific specialities do spy satellites uh, have in general compared to other remote sensing or other observation satellites? And what kind of developments can be expected in this particular sector in the near future? I think that might be our last question, sir. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Fine. So, yeah, I'll take. Uh, um, see, for example, this Megatropics is a collaborative mission between French and uh, uh, Indian uh, ISRO. Okay, Canis and ISRO has worked together. Mega and Tropics. Okay, Mega is cloud in uh, Sanskrit, and then Tropics is about the climate or weather from the French side. So, a set of payloads which has been made to understand the, and also uh, have a very critical input uh, for uh, the weather prediction models and also long term. Uh, and then it also has been specifically put in a particular uh, coverage. So it will give a good input to uh, gaps which are there in understanding the water cycle. That's how it has been totally designed. And it's a very, very uh, successful mission. Because on uh, the maybe because since you have asked a very specific question, instead of answering it, I'll try to get an input on what was the total output of uh, the Megatropics success in putting through and share with with uh, Dr. Sajil or uh, uh, Mr. Kuti so that they can circulate to you on. Okay, but with this, we got a very good understanding in our future missions. Uh, how we had to do for uh, weather related. So that is getting in implemented in uh, many of our sounders and all which we are uh, keeping today. And then the second is on why healthy planet because we didn't uh, uh, explain on 
how this optical remote sensing i just shown you certain signatures okay for example in uh, if the leaf is very healthy so there will be good absorption in the visible uh, red because for the photosynthetic activity but when you come to the infrared depending upon the intercellular spaces so internally the scattering happens within the leaf so the more healthier the leaf more the scattering happens so and there is a cumulative effort in which you will see the the reflectance so there is a, a ratio of near infrared by visible red if you give that is called vegetation index that is directly related to the biomass and the biomass is one which can be used for yield predictions of any crop or any other things there are a lot of models which uh, which you look for so this is where actually these are the two important bands infrared and visible red in the, in the visible uh, red basically it is in the absorption the more the healthy means more healthy leaf more chlorophyll more uh, and these are all related to what is called leaf area index because onion leaf may be good but uh, what happens is erectostylus that means the leaf is straight so that means uh, from remote sensing point of view the amount of signal which is going back may though there is a uh, in erect that is called erectostylus means the leaf is erect whereas unlike other leaves what we see on jackfruit or uh, something like that so each one has its own signature but mostly in infrared it is because of the internal scattering which takes because of the leaf structure uh, that constitutes for uh, the the higher reflectance and on the bowen related there's a lot of outreach activities have been done whatever we are talking about nr sensors all this data is all on bowen and also geo manrega which i was talking to you all today what implementation is happening on the ground is available on bowen means you open on welfare schemes and go to geo manrega and then click into your village you select your village and then look for what works are being done for whom why you need that information want to know okay something is happening there but then you can do such an analysis by doing all this what is the impact it has created has it impact created in water conservation or has it made an impact on soil conservation you want to analyze that's where i was telling you this is something like a 1000 crore uh, project if you bid for one paisa where the government is spending uh, 1 lakh crores now okay what was a 40000 crores has now become 1 lakh crores during this uh, pandemic because the work has to be given again to the migrant workers in their own villages so everything is coded today so you have a host of information and many many of the ministries didn't buy any data nor did they buy any infrastructure on top of it the government of telangana has done how to diesel to the tanks where is the diesel to material to be placed and what is the who are the farmers who are get the benefit and next year they see in the farmers where the silt has been kept from this uh, desilted material their yields have increased adjoining bore wells yields have increased so they document everything and they are doing on bone so they didn't invest they only trained some people and we gave them an opportunity to work similarly for taxation urban taxation for 77 local bodies they used on bone so many of the states are efficiently using and then of course when they graduate they understand they make their own infrastructure with the state remote sensing centers and bone in expansion we have also the state remote sensing centers also has certain terminals but that also going to be augmented but don't look at that as from google google is a commercial activity a commercial this thing and we are authorized to keep only 1 meter resolution data so that's where even as 65 cm we resample to 1 meter and keep at that level and keep updating on uh, this so one is a satellite image other one is a thematic information and many of the ministries data is lying on top of it which also is available for analysis where you can use your big data analytics and then take it forward as an entrepreneur by yourself then you are asking me that uh, uh, the forest related yeah this is one of the first applications by the forest survey of india along with it the initially nrsc has done two cycles then the meteorology so biannual forest uh, whether increase in forest or decrease in forest is published with uh, spatial as well as the statistics by forest survey of india which is responsible for the forest related but then how it impacts you ask me other question on that adverse impacts on uh, in colombia california and other places see for example whenever we have we have in the forest there is what is called uh, there's a there's a break lines like thing for each one that is called uh, fire lines if the fire lines are nicely maintained 
the fires doesn't go beyond control okay there's a way of controlling them so there is a season in which if it is a tropical forest or a dry deciduous forest or if you see the our alpine our forests in uttarakhand and other places in between you have certain vegetation of a different type that's where the heterogeneity works wherever you have the natural springs etc that we have a uh, oak forests are there and within that oak is always uh, so the pine is broken by the oak forest so whenever it comes it uh, halts there but in wherever the and in india we cannot do clear felling we have shown long back if you do clear felling what will be the problems we can only uh, thin the forest at different places and then we uh, redo the process that means you cannot take away the entire forest and do a new plantation you have to do a thinning and then replant depending upon that's called as a forest working plan which has a procedure by which how much you have to preserve how much you have to conserve and how you can use something for a given use and uh, such a mechanism but i find in california and other places i'm other day i was discussing with people it's all more homogeneous in terms of species and then when you have these pine needles or something like that they have extremely good energy these pine needles and they can catch fire in uttarakhand and then it is uncontrollable in uttarakhand already the the local people are collecting these pine needles and they are making into pellets and it is being converted into the energy but there's a small scale if as a youngsters like you if you are able to make a semi automatic type of a mechanical more than a electronic uh, robot you you can collect these on high slopes that means with the weight of uh, fire the firewood load which the people take in that area in that slopes if you make as on a stand the base and then a mechanical arm can pick up these things it's an innumerable value because in terms of revenue and we can reduce the fire but also use it as an energy which can be done for example this is where we have to but if you want to go out try to look at look at someone else and then start working on don't look at that look at a particular practical problem how we can make the imaging concepts how we can use the image processing concepts how we can convert this onto a chip how we can put it onto a, a bipedal uh, sorry a static model which has two hands which can pick it up where you have the this thing and weight of it is less and where it is solar powered and so that uh, it is less uh, less energy it uses so these are the opportunities for you to think and then do such a mechanism then the fourth one is on national security so normally it doesn't do anything with directly with uh, defense defense has their own mechanism to do we are a, basically a civilian use uh, system but we have all the techniques and technologies with isro whatever you want to do it is only question of money okay and we have best of the corpus nat 2 series which has been launched which also has a call in evm that means that the earth is moving and it's moving that means the building two sides of the building we can image and we can get digital elevation models the models have been shown and uh, based on the user request we develop satellites and then give how they use is their different matter okay but uh, okay, yes sir i think there was one question which was left out by dr vibhin krishnamurthy sir should, uh, should i be repeating that which one uh, there was one question sir which was i think uh, left out by yourself uh, should i be repeating that sir what is that okay, sir so the question uh, was about uh, the uh, the influence of remote sensing in national security and defense Uh, how much has it helped India in the past and in the present scenario? And no, no, that's uh, what, what I was telling you. No, no, I, 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 I answered the question. Only ISRO doesn't do that. Okay, ISRO the uh, defense has its own mechanism of doing things. Okay, sir. What ISRO does is, if the user for for any for ISRO is a user. Suppose some user comes and asks a certain specification of a satellite. We do it for them. No, sir. Training, I think the question no, was, sir. Uh, 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 so they, they need training. We train them. Okay, okay, different uh, systems, etc. That because it's not just on imaging. They also know know how to know the weather patterns. Okay, okay real time weather because for air force and all, they need to know about navigation, satellite navigation. They need to know about satellite communication. They need to know about even the weather related information processing. So they get trained at different locations per se. But a per se, ISRO doesn't get directly engaged in their requirements uh, very specifically and then work with them. Okay. we train them whatever we learnt on whatever you see for civilian use the same things can be used for any other purposes but then we don't get involved in it 
anyway jayram our moderator know more about it so we have a, a line in which we don't cross okay for various reasons and then uh, as i was telling you in cortosat series it is not imaging at uh, 50 cm accelerator but we had kept a cameras called evms that's monitoring mechanism so the camera is on and it is on for a certain time when the earth is moving and the satellite is moving but still you are looking at the same object then what will happen it's a fantastic thing to see that means even a smallest movement in any of that area can be picked up in a signal process okay because at that resolution even from how someone comes and goes some make something anything i can detect that is where the detection these uh, for example all these cameras in radiometric resolution these are 12 bit 14 bit such a high end resolutions radiometric resolution they are detecting so much but what our recognizing capability is less so that's what uh, our uh, dr v jayaraman has mentioned all of you have to pro uh, look into digital image processing and how to do this uh, build into certain machine learning techniques so you can bring back processing levels at a much higher level and that is the greatest opportunity for you because no one has this kind of a data only india has thank you sir uh, thank you for the lucid answer and it was very very productive session and i hope uh, all the questions are answered and if you have got many more questions unanswered uh, why we in case sir and ganesh raj is with us all the time so we will uh, address our questions to them separately and get answers over to kutti sir or shajil marsh please thank you once again sir so thank you for this opportunity first of all we get more energetic with your uh, uh, students and the club because they ask very very fine questions i should really appreciate that and nurturing them is something great in fact we also need to get rejuvenated to come for the next talk so the type of questions of uh, are of a high quality and uh, the one on because megatrop is if keep explaining it will go take a longer time so i said uh, because that's a completed project so there's a good uh, abstract level information which will be helpful for these youngsters to know okay hello vijay you are trying to put your mic on anything to say it was by mistake only but i am oh. oh. joining okay mega problem i can say the water and energy cycles of the trial things are a very important objective of that mission both the madras payload and the safir payload were working very well and of course the scara all the three work very well data has been collected quite a lot of data on that as the oil can put it has been used for the what do you call the our our region particularly you know the three number mega drop is inclination 20 degree only it covers latitude of 20 to 20, 20 degree by 20 degree it is a tropical area it was covering the essential thing of tropical convection zone can you make use of that information the water and energy cycles is a very good input it is not a imaging payload you should understand it is a quantitative remote sensing data has been analyzed for uh, integrating to the weather models okay so quite a few inputs are there as we will get put it you will confirm it and give you that also thank you very much thanks jay time has flown like anything two and a half hours <laughs> kori kori jayaraman k jayaraman please carry on hello sir uh, we have come to the conclusion of a very very lucid interaction and good information is there mr children uh, are any more questions i'm sure but we will uh, take it to a different uh, situation and uh, i hope uh, we jayaraman sir is there a big namaskaram to you sir from me from caligate and uh, we will meet you before to one uh, session with you or one or many more sessions the lead so that uh, from my moderation part uh, today we are coming to conclusion from our sessions over to shijil mash and kuti sir to further take the things forward jira yeah, actually hegde rangarajan sir so many are there and seeing them oh, once in a while the, i am seeing them and then put through it says lot of elders are seeing our questions is possible great they are seeing such a every saturday they they are seeing uh, some of them 
sometimes many of them come also. It is, it is their fortune and it is our good luck. Thank you. Shajil Mash, carry on. Shajil. Hello, Shajil Mash. I think time is getting uh, delayed. Time is getting delayed. And that is why probably they are not coming out. They are not coming out because of that. They don't want to test our patience. <laughs> No, I think uh, queries and uh, certainly your students are quite good and uh, they will be able to really understand uh, better. Of course, now two more talks are there by Dr. Egadeji and uh, Rangarajan sir on disasters, which is very much relevant for Kerala now because the recurring uh, landslides and the flood. I am sure that this, those talks will really enlighten the students a lot. And uh, thanks to uh, Kutti sir and Saji sir and uh, Jairaman for giving me this opportunity to address uh, students. And thanks to Dr. UNK, of course, for having nice interaction online. <laughs> then uh, the Jairaman sir, then uh, our Rangarajan sir and Egadeji and all. I thanks a lot because uh, it is really a nice opportunity at least uh, to see on a video and have interaction. Thanks to all of you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. We all know that this webinar has been organized by UL Space Club, a project of ULCCS Foundation, as a part of World Space Week celebration. Today, this occasion brings a lot of enthusiasm and energy, and we are proud to have two eminent persons, Dr. Vivian Krishnamurti and Dr. A. Ganesh Raj from a prestigious institution, uh, from prestigious institutions of India. They have been with us several times. Every time when they were with us, it brought a lot of energy and knowledge to our students and caused to kindle the curiosity of space curious minds. The presence of such an eminent person attracted a lot of viewers for our webinars that makes us grateful to you. Dr. Jairaman, uh, Jairaman Venkataraman also supplemented. I thank Jairaman uh, Venkataraman. On behalf of ULCCS Foundation, I extend our sincere gratitude to Dr. Vivian Krishnamurti and Dr. K. Ganesh Raj for the brilliant and informative uh, speeches on two important topics that is conducive to arouse the interest and imagination of our students. Thanks a lot, sir. We know that a number of eminent persons, such as professors, scientists, engineers, and like that, most of them are usual viewers of our webinars, which is a matter of pride and contentment. Now, I am not mentioning their names, and I, I happily thank them all and expect their further cooperation. I thank all students, student participants of this pro uh, program sincerely. I must thank Sri E.K. Kutisar, who is the chief pilot of UL Space Club 
and thus the program so far conducted since the retirement from official responsibilities he has been working restlessly with us for nurturing the students i extend our sincere gratitude sir, to sri ek gudi sir thank you sir then i thank the persons behind the organization of this program sri k j raman sir sri shadil master master varun master bharat master rajdev master uh, abhinand etc i thank you them once again once more i thank you all with pleasure and wish you a wish you goodness thank you all again <laughs> even after a word of thanks we are going at okay no problem <laughs> we are uh, next program is uh, day after tomorrow the 7th where we are going to have two other national level uh, leaders in uh, <clears throat> application of uh, space to the uh, common man uh, uh, dr v s egde uh, and dr s rangarajan Uh, Dr. V. S. Sekde is somewhat uh, new to us, but Dr. S. Rangarajan has been with us for on a few times. So this this uh, will be generally covering uh, the, the, their talk will be generally on Indian strength in communication, navigation, disaster risk reduction through satellites. That is going to be the title. So both of them are present today. They have. Uh, gone through the entire proceedings today so and uh, they will be able to make best use of uh, what has happened and what is yet to happen they will be able to uh, make a best judgment of what needs to be talked further on this area so this is it and on 9th the, the students are making a presentation uh, of course it is a cosmos their own group they are doing it it is not called the space club uh then later on 10th there is a uh, concluding talk on ocean uh, applications uh, using space uh, uh, so these are the things which we have lined up for this week thank you <laughs>